Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graeme Hill. The Centre for the Study of Global Christianity is based at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in the United States. It's an academic research centre that monitors worldwide trends in Christianity, provides a comprehensive collection of information of the past, present and future of Christianity in every country of the world. Its data and publications help churches, mission agencies and non-government organisations to be more strategic and thoughtful and sensitive to local contexts. The Centre for the Study of Global Christianity is often featured in the New York Times, in The Economist and in the National Geographic. In 2015, I had the opportunity to interview the leadership of the centre, Todd Johnson, Gina Zerlo and Bert Hickman. So over the past 100 years, there's been a pretty significant shift in the composition of global Christianity. Um, one data set that we like to use is between 1910 and 2010 to see the changes that have happened over the past 100 years. And in 1910, 80% of all Christians in the world lived in the global north and only around 20% lived in the global south. But over the course of the 20th century, this has changed dramatically so that by 2010, um, less than 40% of Christians live in the global north and over 60% live in the global south. So this has had huge implications for how Christians live and work and um, Christian interactions with other uh, people of other religions and other Christian traditions. One really interesting fact about this is if you look at continental totals, just in the past couple of years, Latin America surpassed Europe as having the largest number of Christians of any continent in the world, um, which is rather significant considering Europe was the home of Christendom and the home of um, the faith for many, many centuries. Um, so Latin America surpassed Europe, and we anticipate that by the year 2050, Africa will surpass uh, Latin America as having the most Christians. And it could be by the year 2100 that Asia um, could surpass Africa. So in addition to the shift over the past 100 years, looking forward in the 21st century, we anticipate that there will be more and more changes as the decades go on. And this has uh, impacted resources as well, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, the study that we just recently completed showed that even though Christians in the global south are clearly in the majority now, over 60%, uh, they only have about 35% of the resources. That would be personal income and giving uh, to uh, churches and parachurch organizations. And one of the tensions that this creates then is what do the people who have more resources do uh, in relation to global Christianity? And it's often a very difficult question. It's not always the best for the money simply to be funneled in one direction or the other. So I think Christians in most international conferences have faced a great tension in trying to figure out how to deal with the inequities that exist at the global level. Well, people are always interested in trends in global Christianity, what's been happening and what's going to happen in the future. And one thing that's an ongoing trend is the increasing role that Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity plays worldwide. A hundred years ago, the movement was in its infancy, but today more than a quarter of all Christians globally are Pentecostal or charismatic Christians. And so, of course, Pentecostals are in their own denominations. Charismatics are found in many denominations. And that's had a huge spillover in some traditions like Anglicans and Methodists and others, that in, uh, especially in the global south, you're seeing the Pentecostalization of worship. Uh, you're seeing more exuberant singing, you're seeing, seeing more uh, manifestations of gifts of the spirit, even in non-Pentecostal denominations. And so that's having a huge effect on the entire globe. Um, you're also seeing some negative effects of that in some people's minds with things like the prosperity gospel coming from the West to the Global South. And so you're seeing leaders in the Global South increasingly speaking up against uh, things they see as Western phenomena and doing their own theologizing. They're saying, we're not just following the West in liturgy, we're not just following the West in theology, we're establishing things that relate to our context and relate to our situation so we can live out our faith as what it means to be an African Christian or an Asian Christian. 
One other key trend is the role of women in global Christianity. Historically, the church has always been majority women, and currently it is majority women, and into the future we anticipate it still will be majority women. And so with Christianity growing in the global south, a lot of those societies have different roles and different expectations for women. So we're seeing um, women coming into leadership positions, women who are starting their own churches, women who are teaching, women who are evangelists, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and the Pentecostal movement actually gives women a lot of opportunities that they don't have in more mainstream Christianity. That's right, and so that poses, poses a challenge for the Western Church of the role of women in Pentecostal denominations and non-Pentecostal denominations. Anyone who's studied global Christianity knows that it is amazingly diverse all over the world, all different cultures, many different languages. And this creates, in a sense, a problem because there are so many different forms of Christianity. Uh, how are we all going to get along is one of the questions we might ask. And the missiologist and historian Andrew Walls came up with a really nice way of talking about this. Uh, there's two principles, the indigenizing principle and the pilgrim principle. The indigenizing principle says that um, Christianity is meant to go deep into every culture. And therefore, you're going to see a lot of diversity because of that. And yet, the Pilgrim Principle says that uh, we're all not really at home here, that we are all part of a, of a heavenly family. And in thinking in terms of these two things, it's interesting then to talk about how we might um, take on a global identity as Christians. In other words, recognize that we are, are all the same, even though we have great diversity uh, within our family. And I experienced this when I went to work in Thailand for the very first time. Turns out I was the only American on a team there uh, with people from the Philippines and from Malaysia, from Singapore, uh, from Switzerland and South Africa. I mean, we were like a little United Nations. And I'll never forget uh, when we would go to meet with people, they would wonder who we were, where we were from, who we were representing, what country were we representing. Mm -hmm. Yet there was such great diversity even on our little team that it gave a completely different message. And that's always stuck with me, uh, how important it is for us to have a sense of that global identity as Christians. Yeah, and I think we're all Americans. And I think as Americans, sometimes we have an advantage that way and a disadvantage that we're in a country that was built by immigrants and we continue to have immigration. And there are great opportunities for us to interact with people from all over the world and Christians from all over the world. And as I've been in other countries, I've sometimes thought, wow, you know, these people could be Americans and it wouldn't be odd. Uh, anybody can be an American. But at the same time, we, we miss that opportunity because we are afraid of people from other places. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's an opportunity right on our doorstep to have this sort of global perspective that we run away from instead of run to, because anybody can be a Christian as well. And so, but we don't interact with people from different cultures and backgrounds. We just keep to ourselves and we need to change that. I like to think of myself as a member of two global families. Obviously, I'm born into the human family. There's about seven billion of us around the world. Uh, there's great diversity, all these different languages, cultures, amazing food, films, art, music. Uh, it's, really, it's really something beautiful to be a part of. But I'm also a part of another global family. That, is, of course, is the Christian family. Uh, I grew up in the Lutheran Church in Minnesota, and and uh, so I joined that family as a very young person, uh, and that family is also quite diverse. It's about a third of the global human family. And again, there's many cultures, languages, there's great diversity. And I, I'd like to think of myself as a good member in standing in both of these mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a chance a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to a Seder here in Boston, um, and there were 500 people there. And uh, I thought it was just so meaningful to be part of that, that family, of my human family, and to listen to a Holocaust survivor and to listen to a descendant uh, of a, a Christian descendant of, uh, of the Armenian genocide, and to just have the sense that we, were, we all belong together, we're all here, and it's our responsibility together uh, to care for people who might be in trouble today. Mm. And speaking of the Seder, so you were a Christian in a Jewish context, and 
one of these other trends in global Christianity is that of dialogue, of Christians talking with other Christians mm -hmm. and Christians talking with people of other world religions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Christians, historically and currently, have been afraid to engage in dialogue because they feel as if they need to leave their convictions at the door in order to talk with somebody who is different from them. And there, it is true that that kind of dialogue exists where you're trying to find the lowest common denominator between traditions. But there's been this new paradigm of dialogue, both ecumenical and interfaith that really encourages people to come with your convictions, come with what you believe in, come with your personal faith, and let's have a real honest discussion about the similarities and differences. So I think the more that people engage in this second kind of dialogue, the more that we'll be able to see the connections between your global human family, your global religious family, and then where Christianity fits in that. Well, of course, we want to know what can Christians in the global north learn from Christians in the global south? And I think there are many things that we can learn. One of them is bearing up under persecution, because Christians in the global south, whether it's from people of other religious faiths or people of no faith in places like China, have faced over the centuries many types of persecution. Uh, their homes have been destroyed, their livelihood has been taken away, they've been injured or even lost their lives. And certainly in our lifetimes and those of past generations even in the West, we haven't seen that kind of persecution. We get a minor inconvenience and we label it persecution, but we really don't know what it means to be persecuted for our faith. And so we need to learn from those in the global South how they really do stand up under the pressure and the persecution of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now also they have a humility that I think is born out of that persecution and also born out of uh, colonialism that, where Westerners were oppressing people in the global South. So they're not doormats that just roll over, but they say, we know who we are in our faith. We're establishing who we are as African Christians or Asian Christians. And we don't have to make a big deal and force that on other people. We can just be who we are as Christians in our context and be comfortable with that. And I think we would do well to learn from that. I think another thing that Western Christians can learn from Southern Christians is how to live in religiously diverse situations. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of Christians in the Global South are surrounded by people who are not Christians. You have a small Christian community surrounded by Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus. And this is a new reality for Christians in the West because our societies are experiencing increasing immigration. So there are more Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and people of other religions entering predominantly Christian societies. So I think it would be good for Christians in the global north to look at the examples of those in the south and say, how do they deal with the realities of religious pluralism and what can we learn from that? It goes a little further than that too, doesn't it, with the situation in the Middle East mm -hmm. because these communities that have been there for 2,000 years are being pushed out for, for the very first time in large numbers. And our own research has shown that the Middle East was about 15% Christian 100 years ago, now less than 4% on its way to 3. And this is really a crisis not just for Christians in the Middle East, but for Christians all around the world. And it would really be important for us to take action and do something about this. The Global Church Project is located at www theglobalchurchproject.com On our website you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.